This is a poem by Sarah Kay. If I should have a daughter, instead of mom, she's going to call me Point B. <laughs> because that way she knows that no matter what happens, at least she can always find her way to me. And I'm going to paint the solar system on the back of her hands so that she has to learn the entire universe before she can say, oh, I know that like the back of my hand. <laughs> She's going to learn that this life will hit you hard in the face, wait for you to get back up so it can kick you in the stomach. But getting the wind knocked out of you is the only way to remind your lungs how much they love the taste of air. There is hurt here that cannot be fixed by band-aids or poetry. So the first time that she realizes that Wonder Woman isn't coming, I'll make sure that she knows that she doesn't have to wear the cape all by herself. Because no matter how wide you stretch your fingers, your hands will always be too small to catch all the pain that you want to heal. Believe me, I've tried. And baby, I'll tell her, don't keep your nose up in the air like that. I know that trick. <laughs> You're just smelling for the smoke. So you can follow the trail back to the burning house so you can find the boy who lost everything in the fire to see if you can save him. <laughs> or else, find the boy who lit the fire in the first place to see if you can change him. But I know that she will anyway, so instead I'll always keep an extra supply of chocolate and rain boots nearby because there's no heartbreak that chocolate can't fix. Okay, there's a few heartbreaks that <laughs> chocolate can't fix. But that's what the rain boots are for, because rain will wash away everything if you let it. I want her to see the world through the underside of a glass bottom boat to look through a magnifying glass at the galaxies that exist on the pinpoint of the human mind. Because that's how my mom taught me, that there will be days like this. There'll be days like this, my mama said, <laughs> when you open your hands to catch and wind up with only blisters and bruises. When you step out of the phone booth, booth and try to fly, and the very people you want to serve are standing on your cape. <laughs> when your boots will fill with rain and you'll be up to your knees in disappointment, and those are the very days you'll have all the more reason to say thank you, because there is nothing more beautiful than the way the ocean refuses to stop kissing the shoreline, no matter how many times it's sent away. You will put the wind and win some and lose some, and you will put the star in starting over and over. And no matter how many landmines erupt in a minute, be sure your mind lands on the beauty of this funny place called life. And yes, on a scale of one to overtrusting, I'm pretty darn naive, but I want her to know that this world is made of sugar. It can crumble so easily, but don't be afraid to stick out your tongue and taste it. <laughs> Baby, I'll tell her, remember your mama is a worrier, but your papa is a warrior. And you are the girl with small hands and big eyes who never stops asking for more. Remember that good things come in threes and so do bad things. And always apologize when you've done something wrong but don't you ever apologize for the way that your eyes, I'm sorry, your eyes refuse to stop shining. Your voice is small, but don't ever stop singing. And when they finally hand you heartbreak, slip hatred and war under your doorstep, and hand you handouts on street corners of cynicism and defeat, you tell them they really ought to meet your mother. <laughs> Instead of mom, she's going to call me point B so she can always wake, make her way back to me. Isn't that beautiful? So we're in our second week in the leadership series. And really, as leaders, that's one of the things 
that we can emulate the sort of mother leadership kind of example of being that point B, that touchstone, that home base, allowing ourselves to embody that in some way. Now, I know as mothers, we don't always measure up to the ideal, right? Or our own mothers didn't always measure up to the ideal. Anybody have the perfect mother who did all the things that we're talking about in the perfect way, right? Nourishing and, and nurturance and unconditional love and all that good stuff, right? And some of you did. Wonderful. Yet, if we look to the broader idea of mother, the divine mother, we will never fail in that example of all that can be given to us. We can walk right out this door into Mother Nature, for one example, to find that point B, that place of restoration, that place of, of reset, that place that allows us to, to heal and come back integrated and whole once again. Just this week I was on spiritual retreat and I took not one, but two naps on the beach. I know, I'm so blessed. <laughs> And both times, you know, it's that total giving over, you know, the ocean air and the sound of the waves and the feel of, in one case, the rocks behind me and the sand in another. And both times it's that complete reset, going, going back to home base. And sometimes even in the midst of a busy city, we can find that. I remember when I used to um, work full time on the south side of Chicago and then take the L train, which is like our BART, to uh, Loyola University where I was going to grad school. And I would, you know, only have a few minutes and everything was busy and my life was busy and it was loud and it was city grit, you know, the feeling if you've been in the city lately or if you commute to the city. And so there's that kind of sense that, wow, where do you find that respite place? You know, where do you find that, that honing place and that homing place, that point B that we often look for to get restored and to integrate our lives so that we can move forward for the next thing and the next thing. And I found it in a Mother Mary statue. Now, I grew up Lutheran, so Mother Mary wasn't so well featured there. And I was always kind of jealous of my Catholic friends where Mother Mary had a place, you know, because as young women, we really didn't have anywhere to go. Like everything was he and all the leaders were, were male. And so at least in my Lutheran upbringing. And so to have this one representation that was the Divine Mother was really powerful for me. And so I would take a take a left turn, so to speak, on my way, and just stop and be with the statue. And miraculously, there was never anybody around in that busy city when I did this. It was kind of a courtyard of a church. And sometimes it'd be a few minutes, sometimes I'd get 10 or 15 minutes, and I would just sit at her feet, literally. And you know, there was just that sort of open stance that she often has of just love, 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 you know? Open arms, ready to receive, ready to give. And there was such a restoration for me in that. And I don't know what images or icons, if, if any, really speak to you in that way, but there are so many, really, shades of this divine mother energy that we can find. Sometimes Mary is represented in a way that's a little too pious and perfect for us all, right? The immaculate Mother Mary kind of thing. But there are other shades that might be more accessible to us, other faces of this divine mother that might at different times be more accessible for us. Like for example, the Black Madonna. If you've ever seen the Black Madonna throughout Europe, Black Madonna is known. And, and many, in, at least in Southern France, say that that's Mary Magdalene and, and the child that she bore with Jesus. That's one theory. Um, but anyway, there's a different energy there for the way that the Black Madonna is represented. And then there's what she is based on, Iris, I'm sorry, Isis and Horus and the Madonna figures of the earlier Egyptian god and child, Madonna kind of figure. There's also Kuan Yin that many of you might relate to from the East. And you know, all of these have some shade, except for Isis, have some shade of a, based on a living being, a, a, a real person who walked the earth and then kind of rose to sort of deified understanding. And in the case of Kuan Yin, there's actually an androgyny connected to her. So she was originally he in India as Kuan Yin, and then, and then she was picked up again and known in China as the female Kuan Yin. And she got her, her sort of, you know, the key to Kuan Yin is this compassion. You'll sometimes see the, the water um, that she holds. She holds like a water bottle and it flows out, and that water is like the compassion of the divine. 
And her story is that her father was very cruel and that she was so unbelievably forgiving and compassionate to her father that she became a bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is one who agrees to be reincarnated over and over again until all beings are reincarnated once they have become enlightened. So there's so many different ways we can access this sort of imagery or iconic, you know, if that, if that speaks to you, this icon, you know, sometimes I re that really does work for me well, and sometimes it's not as much a part of my practice, but I have an altar filled with gods and goddesses, and, and it really does often speak to me to have that kind of representation, that reminder of the divine human and that mother energy that is so accessible, so available to us, that point B to go to, to be with. Of course, ultimately, it's inside of us. But these kind of help us, these faces of God sometimes help us get to that point. And then there's the living ones, the living saints that are embodying this divine mother, one like Amma. Anybody heard of Amma before, the Indian spiritual teacher? She actually has an ashram over here in San Ramon. She's going to be here June 11th through the 14th. And she's known as the hugging saint. This is her great gift to the world. She does have spiritual teachings and charitable organizations that she runs, but ultimately she's known to be the hugging mama. <laughs> and he, so you can actually have a hug from the Divine Mother. And um, so if you would like a hug from the Divine Mother, you can look her up and, and go have one during that time she's going to be here in San Ramon coming up. She's hugged something like, uh, she's been doing this for 40 some years, like 34 million people and counting, sometimes for up to 22 hours in a day, she's just hugged and hugged and hugged and given that mother love. There's an NPR reporter, Allison Bryce, that talked about her experience with Amma. She said, with great force, she took me in her arms and I was enveloped in the scent of rose. It was a powerful hug and a powerful moment, she said. I was overcome with a profound sense of comfort and calm and clarity. And then I staggered off the stage. So there is this, this idea of mother that is this divine mother, this idealism of mother, and all these traits that go with it that are so hand in hand with the kind of leadership that we need today. The kind of leadership that the world is aching for, really. And it does include the softness of nourishment and nurturance, this kind of ability to be that home base or that point B. So I'm wondering for you and the people you serve, and you may think, well, you know, again, if you're just picking up with us, you know, I want to have you recognize that you are a leader. <laughs> There's all kinds of ways that you affect and impact people in your lives. Maybe you're a, a mother or father or a grandmother or a grandfather. Maybe you have an influence in your neighborhood or you're part of a team or a group or even a social group of friends. You might have a leadership role in an organization or you play on a, a team or, and, and, and you have a leader, even if you aren't named the coach or the teacher or the leader, you still have a, a part to play that can be based on and grounded in these kinds of leadership skills. And so there's a call to bring forth that energy. And so, you know, there might be different ways that you might show up in these different ways as point B. <laughs> You may not even know that you are point B for some people. That being in your presence is something that helps them reset and restore or to even heal something or to get an insight or to feel inspired in some way. You might not even know how you're affecting the lives around you. But if we just keep walking the talk, if we keep emulating these kinds of qualities, we will be giving them to the world whether we know so or not. It doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, I don't think spirit's too worried about recognition for all the love that spirit pours out through the world, right? And so we too, as we emulate that spirit, are not so worried about that. We just keep giving it and sharing it. And, and so maybe you do that just by smiles and hugs. Or maybe you do that by deep and patient listening or encouraging and kind affirmative words. There's so many ways that we can give the kind of healing, nurturance, love, compassion, and forgiveness into the world that the world wants and needs. My mother used to be a really incredibly patient listener. It was one of her great gifts. I mean, even down to super mundane details. I remember when I was a little kid and I was, um, I was really into playing softball, and so my um, neighbors had taken me and the other kids to this 
a movie called Bad News Bears. Did anybody ever see that? About the little baseball team that does everything wrong, you know? And I just loved it. So I came home and I told my mom, like, I mean, from the opening scene to all the dialogue I could remember, scene by scene by scene, what happened in the movie. And she just sat there like she had nowhere to go and nothing to do. And like she hung on my every word. And I remember checking in several times thinking she can't be that interested in this. <laughs> Could have fooled me though. And I loved it, of course, you know, as we do sort of eat up that kind of attention sometimes, that kind of, that kind of open listening, that kind of, you know, I've, you're the most interesting thing that walked in the door and I want to hear everything you have to tell me honey. <laughs> and so we can be that, though, for each other, can't we? I mean, not always. Again, we're, you know, we've got our, our things, you know, where we can't always be all of that. But when we can, we open up to it, right? And we do our best in any given moment to be there, to be that, even if it's just a few seconds of attention. It's that kind of open willingness to be there and be present, to let people kind of be, be heard in that present and healed in that presence and inspired in that presence or just a little rest, a little restore, restoration. Somebody finally wants to hear my story. Somebody wants to listen. Somebody's interested. So there's lots of ways we can take our leadership cues from mothers or from this mother energy, the divine mother. You know, we can provide real, real food for the body, right? That, we can't sell that one short, right? Breaking bread together is something, it's just a ritual that's, that's through humanity that connects us, that brings us together. So for our teams and our families and our neighborhood and all the places we're looking at through the lens of our leadership and our roles that we play, we can bring that, that gift. Like last night, the men that I'm looking at, Paul and the other men who cooked last night for the Tacos del Sol absolutely delicious and it was so nurturing you know to come together to have this beautiful gift of the food but also then the soul food right the soul food of being together in community and dancing together and that's another thing that we offer in leadership by setting that kind of culture by creating that together that kind of culture where we come together we connect we listen to each other we celebrate we have fun and then there's always spiritual food that we can offer, right? M moments of, of, of wisdom that comes guided through us and that is offered to another as a gift, whether they choose it or not. Again, not so much attached to the outcome. Alma talks a lot about that, about being detached from the outcomes and just doing her thing, you know, hugging over and over again. So whatever it is is our thing to do over and over again or to put out into the world, we just do it because... We're guided to do so because we are able to do so, because we know the world needs what we have to offer, these kinds of gifts. You know, so a mother also, and it's also important that we as spiritual leaders remember that sometimes we need a point B ourselves, right? It's really important that self-care, self-love part of, of the whole leadership, that we're not always in giving and, and serving mode, but we also recognize where we can find our own point B. And whether that is the images of the mother or being in nature or having our own spiritual counselor or director or some play, good friend, you know, just a place that we go to get refilled ourselves and to recognize part of leadership is to recognize when we need to do that and to do it. <laughs> Because it, that, you know, that we can't always be in that one way. The law of circulation is giving and receiving for a reason. That's how the flow keeps coming. And it's the same for service as it is for money, as it is for all aspects of abundance. So that's a really important point in the leadership. And also, finally, that we, although I've been talking about us as kind of offering a point B, that we always remember that we are not the ultimate point B. <laughs> you know, that we are just pointing to the truth, right? So we are, as spiritual leaders, pointing to home. We are pointing to the truth that is always inside of the people we serve, right? So that's a key part is that, that we are just uh, uh, somebody who can call forth and tell the truth about where home really is, where that place of, of nourishment really can be found in our own hearts, in our individual hearts. And then there's that aspect of not just like come to mama and come home and be restored and nourish, but also time for the eaglet to fly, you know, <laughs> time to be pushed out of the nest. 
And I can imagine, I mean, I've not raised a child all the way through to that age, um, but I can imagine what that might, li- might be like for those of you who get to that point of letting them flee the nest <laughs> or to give them the nudge out of the nest. And what a shift that is. What a transition time that must be. You know, and so it is for us and the people we lead and for ourselves when we are being led that there is that shift when it's time for us to do it ourselves. At the wedding of Cana in the scriptures, Jesus' first demonstration of what he was able to do was done side by side with his mother. They're sitting next to each other at a wedding. All the disciples were invited to. And the wine runs out. And mom gives him a nudge and says, hey, the wine has run out. And he's like, it's none of my business. (laughs) He actually says, my hour has not yet come. (laughs) A little bit differently said. (laughs) And, you know, there's a depth to this story that I always feel like Mary knew how to do this stuff. And she taught him. And she's at that point where, like, I've taught you all I can teach you. It's your turn. It's your time. And he's going, oh, no, it's not my time yet. I'm not ready yet. I need to go through that. Let's rehearse it. Let's do A, B, and C steps again back at home before I do this out in public, you know? You know how that feels for us when we're not, we don't feel ready, but somebody sees it in us, and they go, go on now. You can do this. And so he does. She's, oh, so, so, so she says, to all the servants, just do whatever he says. She totally sets him up. So he's like, <laughs> okay, so here we go. Everybody fill up the, the bins, you know, the, the barrels filled with water all the way to the rim, and then take a sample and take it to the wine steward. And so the wine steward sips it, and he says, wow. You know, usually the bridegroom serves the wine at the beginning of the evening. That's the best wine. By the end of the night, people don't notice, right? (laughs) But in this case, you're serving the very best at the very end of the celebration. And so, of course, he does what she knows to do and what she has now nudged him into. And that's a part of leadership, a really important part of this kind of mother leadership, isn't it? To know when to call forth, to name the qualities, to say you can do this. Duke Tufty did that for me at Unity of Temple on the Plaza, where I was unofficially an intern minister while I was in ministerial school. And one day he said, oh, we're doing weddings, all free weddings all day long today for Valentine's Day. And I was like, great. And he's like, you want to be a part of it? I said, sure. So, you know, I went with him for the first wedding and I just sort of stood by and I think I had a small part. And then he walked out and he said, you can do the rest of them. <laughs> what? <laughs> It was like a deer in headlights, right? So it was just sort of that baptism by fire, you know? So, and thank God, right, that he had the wisdom to do that. Because otherwise, I know myself, I would have gone home and over-prepared and, you know, thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. But instead, it was just there, you know? And there were the couples coming in. So it was like, all right, we better just do this thing, right? And he did the same thing when a baptism came around. And so... So we can do that for each other, you know, not to set each other up to fail. I think that's, this is part of leadership, is to be able to see and to know, well, they might make mistakes, for sure. Of course we're going to make mistakes, but it's not going to be, you know, terrible. It's going to be a learning experience, and it's okay. What better time to learn than when a bunch of people are streaming in for free weddings, (laughs) rather than, you know, somebody who's invested a lot in this experience, right? (laughs) So whatever it is that we do as leaders, it's that sort of knowing like a mother knows when it's time. And that's kind of that intuitive knowing that we keep working with, right? And we keep opening up and we keep expanding and by trial, by error, get better and better and better at it. So there's also this part of naming that's really important. Naming the qualities. You know, you could think of like the 12 powers in unity. Naming the qualities we see in one another, like love and imagination and order and understanding and will, wisdom, those kinds of qualities. That's a kind of naming, like we do at the beginning of the year with the white stone ceremony where we say we're going to get a new name. 
And what we actually get is a spiritual quality, and it's a name, it's, a, it's an idea, an ideal for us to embody throughout the year. It's that kind of thing that leaders, I think, do for us. It's that kind of naming, very much like a mother might name us and call us by name. Father Gregory Boyle, I referred to last week, he heads up Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, and he wrote the book Tattoos on the Heart. And in it, he talks about this, um, this young man who comes to him. And, and the, the boys are coming to him. They're gang members and ex-gang members that come to him for healing. That ends up being his whole ministry or a big chunk of his ministry. So this young boy is coming up to talk to him. And he says he's all swagger. You know, He said he couldn't be swaggering more in every direction. It was all about image. And he's kind of got this sneer on his face when he sits down by Father Gregory. And... Father Gregory says, what's your name? And he said, he sort of sneers at me as he says, sniper. <laughs> and he says, uh, no, that's not your name. <laughs> what's your name? And he says, Gonzalez. He says, look, I know some teachers around here like to call you by your last name. He goes, that's not me. He goes, what's your name? I want to know what your name is. He says, Cabron. And he says, I want to know what's on your birth certificate. Can you tell me what the name is on your birth certificate? And he says each time he gives him a name, he opens up a little bit more. A little bit more of the armor slides off. There's a little softer boy that's showing up now. And he says, Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon, that is a noble name. That is a historic name. That is a strong name. He said, but that's not what I'm talking about now. I want to know what your mother calls you. And he said, everything shifted in this boy. He said he looked into the distance. There was sort of a, a long pause. And he said he began to talk so softly that I had to lean in to hear him. And he said, well, when my mom's not mad at me, she calls me Napito completely transformed by a name. When we call out the right name, when we call forth the right qualities, when we see something in others that they don't yet see in themselves, or they have felt it before, and it's in that very, as Mary Oliver would call, the soft animal of our bodies. You know, it's in that place, that soft spot, that knowing place, that's that name that our mother called us when she wasn't mad at us. <laughs> Not the full name version, right? <laughs> It's that other one. It's that other one that when we're called by that name, we just sort of melt into it, right? That we know this truth of, of who we are in that kind of soft, loving space of who we are. Father Boyle tells another story of the first day that he was teaching at Loyola. Actually, it was also called Loyola, the school I was walking to. I don't know if I said that. It was Loyola University. And this is Loyola High School in L.A. And it's his first day. It's in the 70s. He's got a you know, arm full of books and he's juggling a cup of coffee and he's nervous and he stops in the doorway of this veteran teacher and he says, I need some advice. It's my first day of teaching. He said she's sitting there reading the times with her feet up, you know, <laughs> and she doesn't even look up. She just puts two, her, her fingers out like this and she says, two things. She says, know all their names by tomorrow and make sure that they know you, they don't want to know what you know. They want to know you. Isn't that beautiful? And so true, right? This is, this is how we lead like mothers. <laughs> this is how we take our cue from that kind of leadership, that kind of divine feminine leadership, and offer it into the world. We know people's names. We call them by name, the name they want to be called by. Then maybe even if they'll let us in, that softer name, that name that feels like, ah, oh, that nickname, that sweet name, that name that calls up all of that openness and kindness and vulnerability in us. And to name the qualities and to call forth the very best in us, to see that, to bring it forth. And then as the leader themselves, not to be up there telling people everything you know, but to let them know who you are so that the connection can be made. These are the keys, right, to this kind of way of allowing our mothers or this mother energy or the divine mother to teach us how to lead, how to serve, how to be of good in the world, to really land that 
in the world. And so as leaders, we provide, just like mothers, TLC, not just tender, loving care, but that is part of it, but it's also, if you will, the T is sort of like the teaching of the skills by example, by living, living example, and the love, the loving fully and completely, loving full out, loving, as we often say, unconditionally, without all the strings, but just loving because we love, because we're here to love, because we are love, and because whoever it is that we are serving and whatever it is that we are serving is love too, and it's love meeting love. And then finally, the C is just calling forth the potential, calling out the very best that we see in one another, calling forth the gifts. That's what leadership, as defined by Brene, who who's kind of our guide on this journey from her book, Dare to Lead, talks about is, as defining leadership, is calling forth the potential in people and ideas and having the courage to develop that potential. So this is what we're about, this TLC, this embodiment of TLC. And let's know this together as we close out. Together, I provide my people TLC. I teach by living example, love, and call forth the best. I'd also like to recognize all the mothers, all those of you who identify as mothers, which might be all of you. If you'd like to stand or just raise your hand and just let us recognize you. Happy, happy Mother's Day to each of you. Thank you for your love.